Welcome to part four and the final part of the worst multi-class series as voted by you guys. The series where you guys give me a terrible multi-class and it's my job to make it as good as possible. Last time we crushed the Rage Mage, but this time will not be so easy. With 255 votes, the number one worst multi-class voted by you guys is the Paladin Monk multi-class. Can the Master Martial Artist mix with the Stalwart Warrior? Let's find out in today's video. This video is brought to you by the Crystals of Zaleth, a survival solo campaign. There was a Kickstarter for this campaign and it absolutely crushed its goals, making over $100,000. So if you wanna join me as well as the thousands of other people who are going to enjoy the campaign on launch, then check it out in the description down below. But with that, let's jump into the challenges that this build faces. The easiest way to describe the challenges that this multi-class faces is a teeter-totter. No matter what, we put into Monk, it hurts Paladin. Whatever we put into Paladin hurts Monk. If you focus on one, the other one just is useless. So it is a complete balancing act trying to find a way to help the two of them and it is not an easy balancing act. Let's begin with our stats. We need four separate stats at least to 13 and that's not including constitution which we probably also need because we don't have the luxury to sit in the back line like Absurd did. Both Monk and Paladin really focus on being in the front line and we're going to have to mix that into our build. So we can't just dump constitution, we don't have that luxury. On top of that, they both need a ton of stats. If you think about building a monk it's basically i'm going to go point by i'm going to go plus one plus one plus one i want to get 16 dexterity constitution and wisdom from there i'm going to be taking asis instead of feats for most of my career that's how thirsty monks are for stats now imagine you have to mix in 13 strength and 13 charisma in that as well and how does that not hurt you of course that's going to hurt you from a monk's perspective same thing with paladin paladin you're likely taking plus one plus one plus one you're going into strength constitution and charisma same thing if the the monk is here, what is it doing other than hurting you? Because it hurts our original stats right out the gate, it really needs to make up for that somewhere. And finding that somewhere has proved to be pretty difficult. Let's take a look at our AC. If we're looking at a monk, we typically get to about 16 AC if we're doing a, an optimized monk using our armorless AC. However, if we go paladin, that's instantly going to drop significantly. We're looking at best, maybe a 15, but probably closer to a 14. So this heavily says maybe we don't hard commit to this dexterity wisdom perspective because if we go armor, then our AC is going to be decent. But if we're going armor, then we lose most of the reasons we go into Monk, we lose our martial arts bonus action attack and we lose the ability to move fast. So we're not even a Monk. We're basically just a nerfed Paladin. So it doesn't matter which direction you go. You're either a nerfed Monk or you're a nerfed Paladin. You're not this chemistry that makes this new beautiful thing. You're just what you were anyways, but worse. But unfortunately, the teeter-totter doesn't end there. Both classes are resource-based. Monks require key points. Paladins require spell slots. If you take some levels in Monk, you're losing spell slots. If you take some levels in Paladin, you're losing key points. Either direction you go, you're hurting the other side once again. And to be the cherry on top, the coolest thing that we should be able to do, we can't do, which is to use Flurry of Blows and drop four smites in one turn and just go absolutely crazy with holy kicks of destruction. But unfortunately, unarmored attacks do not work with smites. So we have one class that wants to use unarmored attacks and one class that wants to use weapon attacks. So once again, even the coolest thing doesn't work, which is really too bad. So given these large challenges, how are we going to overcome them? The stats are bad, but they do tell us the lineages we want to be looking at, stat efficient lineages. That leaves standard human and half elf to me. A note here is if you're going standard array, three of your standard human stats are going to be completely wasted. So it's basically a plus three instead of a plus six. So if you're a standard array, human's completely off the board, you need to go half elf. If you have point by, you can do something with human, but I still like half elf because you get nearly the same stat efficiency, but you get a bunch of extra benefits on top of it, including dark vision and resisting charm. It's just amazing. I'm personally going to be going the Wood Elf variant of the Half Elf. This is going to give us five extra movement speed, which is going to help us out since we are ultimately going to go for kind of a hit and run play style. Assuming point by for a minute, I'm going to break down the stats. I'm going to have 13 in strength, 16 in dexterity, 14 in constitution, 8 
in intelligence, 14 in wisdom, and 13 in charisma. Now this looks more like a dexterity wisdom route, which might make you think that we're committing to the more monk side, but we're actually not. Even though it is favoring dexterity and wisdom, we're gonna be mostly focusing on what paladin brings us and having the monk be the support. So with all of our stats figured out, let's figure out how we're going to balance this teeter-totter and try and make something special out of it. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to be running into melee combat with 14 or 15 AC, which means I'm not using our unarmed armor defense, I'm going to be picking up medium armor, looking for half plate to get us to that nice 17 AC. This means we're giving up on unarmored movement and martial arts. So the question is, what's the point of going into monk if you're giving up on unarmored movement and martial arts? And I believe the answer has to be found in the subclasses. You need a third level feature from your subclasses that is game changing, that is incredibly powerful, and that will change the way the paladin plays. Looking at all these subclasses, I decided on shadow monk. Shadow Monk is going to allow us to cast Pass Without Trace, Darkness, Dark Vision, and Silence, using our key points specifically. So starting with Pass Without Trace, we're going to have disadvantage on stealth since for most of our career we're going to be in half play as a dexterity based Shadow Monk. And so Pass Without Trace is really going to allow us, despite disadvantage, to still be able to stealth and enable our team to stealth with us. Darkness is the true big one here though. It's going to allow us to get semi-consistent advantage. By having consistent advantage, we get more crits. When we get more crits, we get more crit smites. So we found some synergy. If we can set this up correctly, we can be a crit fisher, hit and runner, using darkness as our backbone. And I know there's a lot of issues with darkness that people like to discuss, and I'm going to discuss them in detail. But for now, just stick with me. The next thing we need to discuss is key versus spell slots. Three key is simply not enough. Everything Shadow Monk does costs two key. So basically by having three key, it's the same as having two key and it's inefficient. So we're gonna want to take one extra key. Four levels in Monk gives us that fourth key, which is a respectable amount. And I believe it's the best balancing of that teeter-totter. And from there, the rest can go into Paladin. Now that we know our play style, we can pick a Paladin subclass. Vengeance stands out to me because it's going to give us another source of consistent advantage. On top of giving us a powerful spell like Hunter's Mark, which centers energizes really well with Flurry of Blows, so that's another option that we can bring into our playstyle. Levels 1 through 6, we're going into Paladin. From there, we're going to go 7 to 10 in Monk, and the remainder will go into Paladin to round us off. We're working with a 16 in Dexterity and a 14 in Constitution, so we're already kind of just a weaker Paladin than normal. However, this is a good opportunity to take 2-weapon fighting. 2-weapon fighting on a Paladin, we may not get the fighting style for it, but it's actually not bad because by getting that bonus action attack, we get more attacks, which makes it more likely to get a crit, which makes it more likely we get a big crit smite. So when we're doing a crit fisher build, I like taking a look at two weapon fighting with paladins, and I'm gonna be doing that here. We're gonna pick up wisdom save proficiency, which is great. So we're looking at medium armor, two short swords, wisdom save proficiency, running in there, fighting with our 16 dexterity, 14 constitution. We're not coming in the strongest. There's going to be builds that come in quite a bit stronger, which makes sense because our stats are so inefficient. However, we're not terrible we will be able to help the team out here at these levels. At level two, we're gonna pick up smites, so now we can smite. Smites are great. We're also picking up a fighting style, which for now, I'm gonna be taking for survivability. We're gonna be taking the protection fighting style. But once we hit level four, we need to switch that over to the blind fighting style. That's gonna enable our darkness assassinations, but we're not gonna be able to do that for quite some time. So by going protection fighting style, it just increases our survivability, which we really need with that 14 constitution. Level three, we're picking up vengeance paladin. This, we're gonna be going the vow of enmity as our main thing that we're doing, but by having Hunter's Mark, we can kind of have a secondary play style once we get into Monk. Right now, we're getting two attacks with Hunter's Mark, not bad, and then once we hit level five, it'll be three, so not terrible either. Level four, we're picking up our ASI. We're gonna be bumping our Charisma to 14 by taking a half feat, which is going to be Elven Accuracy. Elven Accuracy takes everything we do, which is look for advantage and attack with it, and turns it up to 11. This is going to allow us to get way more crits, which is going to enable our crit smite play style. So we're really headed towards crit Fisher quite quickly. Extra attack means we do everything that we've been doing a bit better, but the more important part is actually Fine Steed. Fine Steed essentially gives us a roguelike disengage or dash ability on top of giving just a, our base movement speed extra speed. So it really enables everything that we do significantly. So we're going to want to make sure we have our horse up as often as possible. At level six, we're picking up Aura of Protection, which is currently going to be a plus two. Now, this is still a big deal and 
it tells you how powerful aura of protection is that even at half of its potential output it's still a fantastic feature something to note about this build is aura of protection will be a little bit dampened because we don't want to be near our teammates as often as other paladins do we're not this bulwark front line we're more of a hit and runner in their back line and so our aura of protection often won't be helping our allies but there will be moments where we can recognize an ally really needs to maintain their concentration. We can retreat to them before we do our hit and run and can mix in protecting people with the aura protection when it's really required. All right, so this is a good check-in. How are we doing? Well, we're still underpowered. I don't think there's any way of getting around that. However, we're still doing some cool stuff. Even at this level, we can vow of enmity people, go up and get three separate crit fishing super advantage attacks that can potentially drop smites. That's just a lot of fun. It's gonna be decent. We're not gonna be anything insane. We can mix that in with dropping Hunter's Mark maybe after we get our Vow of Enmity up or if we don't want to use our Vow of Enmity. And with three attacks, that's an extra 3d6 of damage. It's respectable. The combination of our decent AC, our decent HP, and our horse largely allowing us to go in and out of combat, we should be fairly defensive enough to be fairly survivable. But let's move into our Monk portion now. At level 7, we're picking up Monk, which is flat out an investment level. At Monk 2, we pick up Key. Flurry of Blows synergizes quite well with our Hunter's Mark, giving us four attacks instead of three attacks to get that extra d6 of damage. Stands out a lot more if we already have Vow of Enmity set up. And thanks to Aura of Protection, our concentration is going to be decent at these levels, so we can expect to take a couple hits and not break our concentration. We largely won't be using Step of the Wind because the horse takes care of most of it, but we may be taking bonus action dodges here and there. But we, we really want to focus on our offensive output because we've already invested a lot into our defenses and our offenses need it. All right, Monk 3. Monk 3 is a massive level for us because it really enables us to get into the crux of our gameplay. Yes, we haven't been fully online until this moment, but we've had stuff we can do. We're not useless, but really this build starts to shine at level nine, which is really late, but what are you gonna do? Now, darkness is interesting to discuss because at one point in D&D's history, people thought it was the best strategy to do for the team ever. Constant advantage, constant disadvantage against you, and it's amazing, right? Well, then it had a, a change of opinion where it was seen as it just gets in the way of everybody, it sucks, it's no fun. And for me, I pendulum swing it kind of back towards the middle. There are fights that it's great and there's fights that it's terrible. But we want to do everything in our power to enable it to work with our teammates. There's two things we can really do to make darkness much more bearable for our team. One is having fine steed. Having fine steed allows us to move so much quicker and position ourselves pinpoint where we need to be. So we can put ourselves right behind and the front line of our enemies, create darkness so it only covers certain enemies and leaves other enemies. So we can kind of create a divide and conquer situation using darkness if we have the space to work with. The second thing we can do is have a container ready to cover the darkness, which turns it off. We have a free item interaction. My favorite way to do this is to have a tongue piercing, cast darkness on your tongue piercing and just close your mouth and that turns off the darkness. So for a free item interaction, we can either turn the darkness off or on and that enables us when things do get hairy and we do need to be next to our teammates we can get our attacks in then we can use our free item interaction to turn it off next turn we use our free item interaction to turn it back on get our attacks in and then we can retreat from the situation allowing our allies to continue seeing that said there are going to be times where darkness isn't the right move and luckily we can still do our vow of enmity we can still do our hunter's mark and flurry of blows set up from there when darkness isn't really what we're looking for getting to 10th level we're going to be taking Taking fourth level in Monk, we're gonna get an ASI to boost. I'll be bumping decks at this level. Charisma is tempting to get the better aura of protection, but I wanna get our decks to at least 18 before I make that commitment, just for the extra accuracy and damage output. More importantly though, we're getting that fourth key point, which means we can do two darknesses per short rest, which is a solid amount. And from here, we have our build set up. From there, we're gonna be going the rest into Paladin. A really standout moment would be getting improved Divine Smite, which means every single one of our weapons attacks adds more damage on top of it so it makes us a better assassin and the next big moment would be getting the find greater steed haste is another big moment for us we're going to get that extra attack and extra movement speed and our horse does too so it makes us incredibly fast we can hit hard and we can hit often as for asis we might consider maxing out decks this allows us to drop the medium armor have the same ac and not have disadvantage on our stealth checks and whether or not you decide to do that from there we'll be going into charisma to make our aura protection that much better the play style again is really focused on single target assassination 
we want to locate someone who looks vulnerable. We're not necessarily on the front line. We don't want to go tangle with their tank. We want to go tangle with their wizard. We want to go get close to them. We want to drop a, a darkness over us and we want to start smacking the absolute crap out of them. Get advantage, hit them three times per turn. In those three attacks, we're going to be rolling nine dice. There's almost a 50% chance that we're going to be hitting a d20 eventually among those attacks. Probably closer to 40, but the point is we're going to be doing it pretty often. Once we drop it, we drop a gnarly smite on them, trying to eliminate those squishy targets. So we play very much so like an assassin. Once we kill them, we move on to the next one. What's kind of nice about this playstyle is it feels very roguish, but we don't have to rely on our teammates setting up our damage output. We can just go to the squishiest person who has the most spell casting or the most damage output and just absolutely destroy them. When darkness fells, we can do the same thing by throwing a vow of enmity on the most dangerous squishy enemy and going and doing the exact same thing without the protection of darkness. But it is worth saying that this is a very powerful counter to spellcasters. When we're in darkness, we can't even be targeted by their abilities and they can't see where to teleport. But things like Misty Step are a lot less powerful. On top of that, they're generally squishy and we can just nuke the crap out of them pretty quickly. Even when we're out of darkness, because we have aura of protection, our saves are better than average when it comes to fighting them when they're making us make those saves. So we're really good at taking out those dangerous spellcasters. Similarly, we're pretty good at taking out archers because we're fast. We can get right up next to them so they have disadvantage. They're either going to have to take an opportunity attack or switch over to melee or attack us at disadvantage. You can really quickly put them in a no-win situation. Our weaknesses include our range, our tankiness, and while we won't be bad in the early game, we do get fully online fairly late. We could go monk earlier to get the darkness earlier, but waiting on extra attack and aura of protection just seemed counterproductive to me. So how do we do? Well, when it's all said and done, we're a darkness assassin. And I hear some people saying if you went three levels into Hexblade, you'd also get two darknesses per short rest, but then one of your weapons would be charisma based and you could be way more stat efficient. And you're right, this is not an optimal build at all. I don't think there's anything you can do with the paladin monk multi-class that can't be done better with a different multi-class. But the question to me wasn't is it the most powerful or did I do something spectacular? No, I think this is probably below average, but my goal was to do something playable. And I do think this hits that playable mark. I think we got to it in an interesting way. Paladins normally don't pick up two weapon fighting. And it's interesting how that two weapon fighting enables us to do what we need to do. And it's especially weird because monks usually give a bonus action attack, but we opted to get a bonus action attack in a much more convoluted way. And I think it's the right route, as odd as it is. And I like that creativity. I like that oddity that this multi-class brings. And at the end of the day, this is a very strong candidate for the worst multi-class in the entire game and it still can be playable and I think that really shines to me as D&D being designed fairly well that we complain a lot you know I complain a lot about a lot of the design choices but ultimately if you can play any multi-class and make it playable that's not bad game design sure you could say some of the subclasses if I if I was forced to do some subclass multi-class with another subclass instead of the full class, then I think there is a chance that we'd get to the unplayable realm. But honestly, there's like 117 subclasses. What can you ask of these guys? To balance every single one of those together is a little out there, I think. And with that, my friends, the worst multi-classing series comes to an end. It was a joy. It was fun to vote with you guys, and I'd love to do something similar. If you guys have any other ideas of votes we can take and community we can interact with to create multiple different videos and series, I'd love to hear it from you guys. I love you guys. You guys are the best. Appreciate you all. And with that, I hope you have yourselves an incredible day and I'll catch you on the next one. See you then.